even the liberals are calling him a chameleon in their own way. They're not saying chameleon yet, but they're getting close to it. And I've actually done a new analysis of the president, and I'm calling him the Marxist chameleon, which, of course, will be tomorrow's uh, lead headline on uh, the golfer show who stole the, the word regime and the con, 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 concept of regime last week. But that's okay. It doesn't matter who, who copies who. What matters is that the message gets out. So the Washington Post says Obama's making nobody happy. They say conservatives see him as the reincarnation of Karl Marx. Liberals are frustrated by what they perceive as one sellout or another. And independents are worried about the economy and nervous about health reform, and they don't see any moderation in him. And he's pleasing nobody. Unions are unhappy because they didn't get everything they wanted. Gay rights advocates frustrated because they didn't want, they didn't get don't ask, don't tell. Women's groups are upset about the abortion restrictions in the new health care law. Communist civil libertarians uh, are infuriated about the administration's legal positions in the war against terrorism, from indefinite detention of Islamo-fascists to warrantless wiretapping to military commissions. African-American groups are concerned that uh, Obama's administration has not done enough for minorities, particularly in the era of job creation. Hispanic groups bemoan the lack of action on uh, amnesty for illegals. And so his only uh, support base is from the activist infrastructure, the communist, socialist, anarchist, who he identified with uh, later on in his life. Now, there's a new biography out on Obama, which I'm not going to mention who wrote it or why, because I don't, I don't intend to have you buy it. I don't think many people will. My suspicion is it will sell fairly well, but it's really, you've read it all before. There are only a few things about the life of Barack Obama that are worth mentioning in, in this show today. And that, I'm going to read a few sentences. And that is, Obama comes to Chicago. And it says Obama is uh, trying to find himself. And he's trying to come to terms with his uh, absent father and his naive mother. And he's trying to forge an identity of his own. Now, this is not unique to Obama. There are many people who are trying to get away from a father and mother for whatever reasons and become you know, their own person. But it's interesting what he says about race here. And I have to mention it, frankly. Because it explains an awful lot of the enmity that Obama is creating in this country amongst blacks and whites, incidentally, in, in, my, in my estimation. So he goes to Harvard Law School and the University of Chicago, and no, one's, no one knows what he wrote or what he did there. They hide his records. And he learns certain things. And they say Obama is a, a son who aspired to be calm, rooted, and responsible in all the ways that his volatile and unreliable Kenyan father was not. And so he then turns to communist leftists and uh, uh, left-wing uh, uh, radicals such as Lawrence Treve of Harvard, Senator Richard de Turban Durbin, Demon Cat of Illinois, and they become his mentors. And there he is. It says, uh, in high school, Barry eventually stopped writing letters to his father. His effort to understand himself was a lonely one. Touchingly, awkwardly, he was giving himself instruction on how to be black. Now, this is interesting got to listen to this carefully. Step by step, as Obama grew up with his white grandparents in Hawaii, did you know that? Did you remember that part of it? Quote, he began immersing himself in an African-American culture that seemed to live thousands of miles from where he was. So although his, his grandparents who raised him were white, he now starts to identify with an African-American culture that was thousands of miles away. Remember, he's in Hawaii. So he listens to music. Nothing wrong with it. I listen to the same musicians. Stevie Wonder, Grover Washington, Miles Davis. He uh, reads Richard Wright's Native Son. He reads the poems of Langston Hughes. He reads the autobiography of Malcolm X. He reads the essays of James Baldwin, which I read. He reads Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, which I read. And as he reads these books and as he talks to people, he decides that he wants to identify with that side of his being. But most importantly, even though he's a chameleon and doesn't know who he is really, he gets a firm sense of who he is through the communist organizers in Chicago. And he becomes an organizer. And this is the most important part of what I'm saying to you today. Although he is not sure who he is racially, because he isn't sure of himself, even to this day in my opinion, you see a lot of this ambivalence. He is not sure of himself Class-wise, from the Marxist point of view, which class does he belong to? He certainly wasn't poor. I mean, which part of the class struggle do you find Obama 
came from. He didn't come from poverty, did he? For God's sakes, his, his grandmother worked hard in a bank. They sent him to a private high school. Who paid for it? I don't know. Who sent him to Yale? How did he get in? So he wasn't poor in terms of uh, the, the, the communist uh, idea of class struggle. What class did he belong to? So again, he doesn't know who he is class-wise or race-wise, truly. But he finds who he is through the socialist communists, the socialists and communists that he identifies with, and that becomes his identity. And now uh, the biographer says, for Obama, the black freedom struggle defines not just the African-American experience, but the American experience itself. I disagree with him totally. I don't think Obama identifies so much as an African-American as much as he does as a Marxist American. Now, I just created that hyphenated Americanism because it's not been used yet. It'll be used tomorrow by Wallbanger. They divide up the night before uh, who gets what from Michael Savage. The golfer got the other one, so Wallbanger gets that or Ham gets it. I don't know who. But I would say that Obama is clearly a Marxist American. Or you want to say socialist American to make yourself sound more moderate, go say what you want. doesn't matter to me. But there's another analysis of the chameleon that we have for president, which I linked up on michaelsavage.com. And from all places, it's actually from one of his supporters, I believe. I hope it's still up there. Here. Even Obama's fans notice he's a phony. And <clears throat> they quote a woman from PBS. And I'm going to quote her in a minute as soon as I get the download. I had computer up here. Even Obama's fans notice he's a phony in how he writes, talks, and even walks. Tim Graham, Newsbusters. How phony is Barack Obama? PBS Washington Week host Gwen Ilfil reviewed New Yorker editor, uh, uh, New York new biography, The Bridge, the one, blah, blah, blah. And she kept finding Obama is a slick Barry, a shape shifter. Obama even admitted to rhetoric, what should be obvious, how he changes dialects depending on the audience he's talking to. Obama says this, the fact that I conjugate my verbs and speak in a typical Midwestern newscaster's voice, there's no doubt that this helps ease communication between myself and white audiences, he tells the biographer. And there's no doubt that when I'm with a black audience, I slip into a slightly different dialect. But the point is, I don't feel the need to speak a certain way in front of a black audience. There's a level of self-consciousness about these issues, the previous generation, blah, 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 blah. So he's the offspring of a white mother and an African father. And the biographer says he learned uh, shape-shifting when he arrived in Chicago. Reared in Hawaii and Indonesia, he had never encountered a place where race was so determinative. One old Chicago friend observes. Uh, Ill Phil relayed that this wasn't contained to talking, but even to walking. Bobby Rush, the congressman and the former Black Panther, is apparently still disdainful of the young Harvard Law School transplant who had the nerve to challenge him in 2000. Obama lost badly in part because black voters were suspicious of his racial bona fides. In one of the book's most remarkable passages, Bobby Rush mocks the president during an interview in his congressional office getting out of his chair to make fun of Obama's distinctive rolling stride. The smooth strut, Rush suggests, was something Obama appropriated from the street to appear more at home around black people. Let me tell you, he said, I never noticed he walked like that back then. Now, I noticed that first. I was the first one to say he bopped up to the podium in the beginning. Remember when he bopped? Uh, I was the first one to say he started bopping after he became president. I'm just telling you, I said it. I saw it. I see everything. Those who lost to Obama also complained that the newcomer got an easy ride from the news media. No kidding. No kidding. We didn't understand why his politically calculating chameleon nature was never discussed, an aide to Clinton says. We were said to be the chameleons, but he changed his life depending upon who he was talking to. Now, it's not unusual for politicians to be actors. That we understand. In fact, the politician and the actor have much in common. We understand that Hillary Clinton has gone into various brogues when she's in uh, Palm, uh, uh, West Palm, excuse me, when she's in Boca Raton, when she was campaigning, suddenly she, she had a nasal in, incantation. When she went into the South, it sounded as though she was drinking some of what Jimmy Carter uh, and his family grew up on. So the fact is that politicians do this all the time. I don't find that odd, odd at all. But I do find it interesting that the reason Obama is making nobody happy is because he's a chameleon. But people don't understand that he's not really a chameleon. He's only a physical chameleon. 
He is not a, a, a political chameleon at all. He's much smarter than any of his detractors think he is. And as I said today, I believe he is the first Marxist American in the presidency. And I'll be right back. 